Hello, everyone. Welcome to thematic session 14. Um, hello, uh, Chris. Um, welcome on board. We would appreciate uh, if you could put on your your microphone and your video. We'd like to see you, if possible. So um, session 14 is about strengthening the capacities of caregivers in the times of uncertainty such as uh, COVID-19. We are strengthening their capacity so that they can protect children. And uh, today we are privileged to have the opportunity to go all the way to North Africa. I don't want to say a lot. We will wait until we hear from the horse's mouth. You are most welcome. We are looking forward to a lot of interaction uh, amongst yourselves, amongst you with the presenter who I will, I will introduce shortly. We would like to hear from the presenter, but we also would like to learn and share from, from each other. So be ready, um, listen, and also share with the, with each other, with the presenter um, as we go along. Um, so uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the presenter. I am very, very fortunate to be the one to, I'm very fortunate to be the one to introduce Noha. Noha is a research and knowledge management senior specialist with Watanea Society. Watanea Society is an organization based in Egypt, um, and it does a lot with children without uh, appropriate care. She will tell you more about it. Noha received her master's degree in community psychology from the American University in Cairo. Her thesis was, uh, was about assessing the resilience of adolescents raised in care homes in Cairo and identifying the factors that facilitate resilience. Resilience is a key um, asset that is necessary for everyone, particularly adolescents, um, especially at these trying times of COVID-19. Uh, previously, she's worked as a researcher and a gra graduate teaching assistant. And for her great work, she has received an award from the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. There is a lot more I could say about her, but we do not have time. So I'll leave it there. But before I hand it, I hand the floor back to her, I would like to say that her most important um, achievement is that she is a mother. And so she's doing child protection right from home. Um, Welcome on board, Noha. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Achin, for this lovely introduction. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, to start with a little warm up, you'll find in the chat box uh, a Mentimeter. So come kindly uh, press on it. And we would like to know where are you calling from today? Just to be aware, it might take a second to um, to update with a couple others. So it usually just jumps with a bunch of people all at once. <laughs> okay. Let me find the mentee. So one of us is from Rwanda. Yeah. So uh, we are calling from USA, Turkey, Rwanda, Geneva, Switzerland, Brussels, Rabat. Um, I also see in the chat, um, people have mentioned that they're from Algeria, uh, 
a Brundi, uh, Iraq, uh, and Burkina, which is fantastic. Great, Kat, Tani here. Do you mind giving me the host so I can quickly live stream? Yes, of course, one moment. So again, Rwanda, USA, Turkey, Brussels, uh, Burkina Faso, Geneva, London, um, Rabat. That's very interesting. Kenya. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for sharing that. It's really uh, an honor to meet all of you. I wish we can. Uh, hopefully uh, during the session, after the session, uh, discuss more. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Um, the first uh, part of the, about 10 minutes of the session would be um, just introducing more about uh, alternative care in, um, in Egypt. And uh, I would love to hear more from you. So the next half of the session would be uh, more of discussions of, um, we'd like to hear more uh, about you. So. Uh, as Aching thankfully said, um, and uh, thank you, Katrina, for organizing this as well. Um, we're discussing today what uh, what Tanaya Society um, did uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of brief to get to know the context more uh, of the alternative care uh, sector in Egypt. So the main alternative care setting in Egypt is residential care facilities or care homes. Um, and usually children are uh, end up in care homes because of financial difficulties or because losing one or both parents or because they were abandoned. Um, and unfortunately, care homes in Egypt, um, th there were no standards to guarantee that all children inside care homes would receive the same um, quality care. Um, and in particular, to child protection challenges because care homes in Egypt are managed by civil society organizations, uh, there is a lot of discrepancies between uh, the quality of care that they receive inside care homes, uh, because it really is dependent on the managers or the administration's uh, set of beliefs, set of skills or background. So in particular to child protection, um, there often are no clear policies or procedures in regards to child protection. Caregivers often lack the fundamental knowledge of how to protect a child, how to report uh, if a child abuse case uh, occurred. Children themselves uh, are not aware of their own rights or don't have the skills to report uh, incidents to defend themselves. Because of all of these challenges, Watanaya Society was founded in 2008 in order to create a future of equal opportunities for children and youth without parental care, and doing that through unifying the standards of alternative care. It has been since 2018 one of the leading organizations in the reform of the alternative care in Egypt. It has assisted the government in its journey in the deinstitutionalization. As I said, care homes or residential care is the most prevalent alternative care uh, option. Uh, when we started, there were around 500 care homes. And we are in the journey of reducing that number and promoting more alternative family-based and community-based uh, alternative care settings. Um, in order to guarantee that children receive the care and um, uh, the love they uh, deserve, uh, since 2008, we started to develop the quality standards for care. Hi everyone, please just hold on for a moment until we have Noah, uh, Noha reconnecting here. Thank you so much. Please just hold on for one moment. Uh, Aching, you're just muted at the moment. No. Oh, okay. Oh, no, so I think it's my internet connection. Welcome back, yeah. Nora. <laughs> Thank you. Where, 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 um, 
you will have to share Where this. Did it, uh, and that's okay. It might be easier on your internet connection. Would you like me to share the screen for you and you can just let me know when to switch slides? Yes, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, Katrina. fantastic. Just give me two moments here, please. Sure. So actually, where where did I uh, where did it cut? Um, the fact that you are um, influencing the movement from institutional care to family based care. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, looking okay, forward to hearing the achievements and the challenges. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Noha, can you please just let me know when to stop flicking through, sure. and you can just let me know where you were in your screens. Sure. Can you? Uh, um, yeah. Again, another next slide. Next slide. Yes, another slide, please. Yes, we're here. Okay, fantastic. So, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, so um, since 2008, Watanaya actually has pioneered the development of the quality standards for alternative care. And uh, it was really a bottom-up approach where we listened to the voices of children and youth. And we, uh, it was a very inspiring journey where we asked children and youth, how would you imagine your dream home to be? And it was um, a very insightful journey with um, other NGOs and INGOs working on the alternative care sector uh, in Egypt and the Ministry of Social Solidarity. Um, and we uh, succeeded in 2014 advocating and mandating these quality standards to be obligatory in all care homes in Egypt to um, apply these quality standards to guarantee that children inside care homes are protected uh, and receive quality care. Next slide, please. In order to further uh, promote child protection, in 2017, we developed a child protection toolkit. And before then, there was no uh, contextualized uh, child protection toolkit that could actually um, promote uh, child protection inside care homes and teach children and caregivers and managers how to best protect children in this setting. And since then, we've been conducting trainings with them. Next slide, please. Um, and this is really, um, I know we have a, a short time, but I would be more than happy to discuss more and uh, share with you the website. But this really, the socio-ecological model of Brunford Brunner really sums up what we do. We intervene in so many uh, layers and the child and the youth are at the center of our intervention. But we intervene with all uh, of those layers as well in order to have the ripple effect of uh, protecting and care for children. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. As all of you know, um, no, Katrina, uh, can you get the response part? Yes. Going before it. <laughs> no, the one before it. Sorry, it's moving itself. I swear yes. it's not me. <laughs> yeah, that happened. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was it's <laughs> so the this first time? one, the response. No, the response one. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank so. You. All of you know, it's okay, thank you. As all of you know, um, the pandemic has put a lot of children at risk of child protection violations. So what we did was starting a dialogue, like what we always do, listen to um, care homes, what do they need at this uncertain time? We, and, and the care home here, I mean, we listen to children and youth, we listen to the caregivers, to the managers, to understand how can we be of most assistance to them. Next slide, please. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, as a result of the, of the dialogue that we had, uh, we identified that caregivers were the ones really struggling during the pandemic. Can you imagine it's a lockdown, uh, you're caring for about 10 children uh, in the age of six, it was very, very challenging. They didn't know how to deal with the children. So it was best, uh, so they suggested that they needed psychoeducational sessions to help them deal better with the children. Uh, in addition to, we provided online child protection uh, workshops to the children. Again, as I said, we work holistically on all the level on all the levels of the ecological model. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
Yes, so we conducted tribe protection um, workshops in order, and they included interactive um, sessions uh, to raise awareness uh, about how to protect themselves, the children, how to protect themselves from the virus. And it included activities to raise awareness of the children um, about their physical and sexual abuse and how to protect themselves from it. Next slide, please. So what we did was that we teamed up with experts in child protection and um, in child psychology, and they provided interactive uh, psychoeducational sessions. Uh, through the months of May, June, July, uh, we conducted 10 sessions. Next slide, please. So we really wanted to identify whether uh, these child protection, uh, these psychoeducational sessions were effective in reducing child protection violations. So next slide, please. So we had a hypothesis that if caregivers were more aware of their emotions and they were able to deal with this uncertain time, this will lead them to better deal with the children, listen to them, empathize with them, and this would decrease the child protection violations. So we had the evaluation question of to what extent would um, this program help decrease the possibility of child protection violations inside care homes. Next slide, please. So we had a convenient sampling. We used a mixed method questionnaire that was sent online. And uh, participants, the only condition was the participants would have at least attended two training sessions through the months of May, June, and July. Next slide, please. And the findings were, next slide. Quickly, the demographics, 55% of the participants attended at least, uh, um, who attended at least two sessions uh, filled in the questionnaire. And the average amount of sessions the participants attended was around seven, uh, six sessions. Next slide, please. The demographics, the majority were between the age of 25 and 34, and the majority were females, which is very common in the caregiver profession. Next slide, please. There were three recurring themes in the analysis. The first one was that the caregivers were more aware of their emotions and were able to deal with this uncertain time. And that led them to uh, better listen to the children, understand their frustration, put themselves in their place. And that led them to uh, be able to better support and, uh, and, and support and help the children during this uncertain time. Next slide, please. So the first theme was, um, as you can see, most of the um, this section was highly uh, evaluated. And uh, the most significant for us was the last question was that the, base, the, the, the child protection, the basis of um, self-care is the basis of caring and protecting children. And this, is, this had the highest score and that's very uncommon in uh, the caregiver profession, but we believe that having this achievement is a success for the program. Uh, still, we need to dig deeper to understand what other factors contributed to understanding that self-care is that important in such profession because that has a direct impact on the children's well-being and protection. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the second uh, theme was uh, caregivers were more able to actively listen to the children. And this is something that they cited a lot in the qualitative questions that they were able to listen. And this is something that the, the, the second the child would misbehave or do something, they would just jump into how to solve the problem instead of listening, empathizing, taking a step back and understand the frustration. But really the, the sessions help them do this in such uncertain time. Next slide, please. Here are some quotes from um, the caregivers and, and they say the same thing I told you. Actively listening to, ch to the children was something that was really great to them. Next slide, please. The last theme was the ability to support care, uh, to support the children. And as I said, this is the sequence. If I'm able to cope with my emotions, I'll be able to empathize and support the children and, and finally I'll be able to support them and help them. And this was highly evaluated as well. Next slide, please. And finally, we want, really wanted to uh, the participants to reflect on the, four, uh, the past four months during the pandemic to reflect on a child who misbehaved and they wanted to discipline uh, him or her, what would they do? 
and uh, the majority of them said that they would talk to the child and let them understand what they did wrong and start to solve it and work it out together, which is what was really a surprise because um, corporal punishment I mean, is very uh, prevalent in a country like Egypt. Uh, and um, this was actually um, one of the things that was surprising in such lockdown situation and shows that caregivers really just need to need some support, they need trainings, they need to understand what methods work. Because as you can see, one of the caregivers, he said, this is the best way actually to discipline children and work around the problems. Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah, next slide. In conclusion, next slide, please. We can see from the, uh, the analysis here is that the majority of the caregivers were more aware of their emotions. They were able to deal with the uncertainty caused by the situation. The majority of them were able to empathize, understand uh, their emotions better, which led them to be able to take a step back, understand children's frustration, reassure them and support them. And finally, the majority of them used discipline uh, method that did not violate child's rights. Next slide, please. Finally, what we learned from that is, and what we learned through our journey, starting a dialogue with the different stakeholders is, is key really in uncertain times because we, we all don't know what to do. So it's really um, important to talk to, uh, listen to the stakeholders and work this out together. The second thing is as a local NGO or, and as others during this uncertain time where financial resources are scarce and funding is very difficult, it's really important to mobilize and maximize whatever resources we have. Um, and uh, finally- Oh, sorry um, about that. <laughs> you, no, it's okay, it's okay, Katrina, thank you. Uh, and finally, it's it's evident, we, we saw that through our journey, but through this uncertain time, it was very important to help caregivers really cope with the uncertainty because coping with their emotions and with the uncertainty will help decrease child protection violations inside care homes. And um, please, uh, Katrina has posted a link, a Q&A link in the chat for please, whatever questions you have, kindly put them there and we'll have some time at the end to discuss. But now we would like to hear from you. Can you get the next slide, please? Thank you. We have a discussion question. As you saw, our intervention really focused on caregivers and children who had some kinds of resources. They had at least an internet connection. They had a computer. They had something that we can reach. But how can we reach the most vulnerable? How can we most reach the most marginalized who don't have necessarily access to these resources? So now kindly we'll break out into uh, breakout rooms. Can you get the next slide please, Katrina? Thank you. I need three things from you. First thing, please pick a person who would answer the questions on Mentimeter. Second thing, discuss the question together as a group. And third thing, kindly add the top two answers on your Mentimeter. So Katrina, please, can you divide them into breakout room? Thank you. Yes, of course. And I would um, just like to, to stress um, to please uh, turn off your uh, turn on your camera and turn on your microphone um, so that you can have the best possible discussion with everyone. Um, with the numbers that we have, uh, Noha and Aching, would you like to go into breakout rooms with people to help facilitate the discussion at all? I could do two groups um, of approximately 10 people, which is quite nice. Yeah, that would be excellent. Thank you. Okay, okay great. I'm sending you all in now. Thank you. Orphan, a word that makes us think of a little child, deprived from family care, and we only think of their simple needs as a child, a toy, coloring pencils, new clothes, but we forget that just like any other child, as they grow older, their needs grow with them. This is why Watoneya began. Since 2008, orphans have been our main focus. We know that just like any other field, orphan care requires a certain set of skills and knowledge. These stem from the quality standards for alternative care. We developed these standards to ensure that every orphan is provided with quality of life within a family that understands the orphan's needs. 
and provides them with a safe, caring, and stable environment from their early life until they grow up to be independent. We began at the place where the children live and need to feel warmth, love, and safety, just like any other child in their home. Watonea developed a methodology to help those who manage institutional homes apply the quality standards. We provided them with quality trainings and consultations in managing their institutional homes and dealing with children and youth. In 2015, we launched Beit al Helma Award for the best institutional homes, applying the national quality standards for alternative care in Egypt. We wanted to highlight the successful examples in the orphan care field and encourage more institutional homes to apply the standards. The quality standards focus on ensuring that each and every child finds the best care. Wotoneya thought of how the caregivers in institutional homes can be more efficient in their role with children and youth. This led to the establishment of Amen for Learning and Development, certified by Pearson UK. The center provided specialized programs for caregivers, from alternative mothers and social workers, to managers of institutional homes. Those programs develop and heighten their personal and technical skills in childcare and managing and developing institutions. We also began with fresh graduates by providing vocational trainings to qualify them to work in institutional homes. By focusing on children and youth, we thought of the capabilities and potential we can unlock in each one of them. So we designed programs for the little children to build their self-confidence. And because the orphan won't stay a child forever, our journey with them continues so that they can reach self-fulfillment and build a stable life. We designed youth programs to help them improve their personal and life skills and prepare them for their professional life. We believe that each person in society can have a role in providing a quality of life for every orphan. So we provided trainings to volunteers and kofala. We started the school program where teachers and students adopt an institutional home and help it apply the quality standards. Not to mention our awareness of media and social media to increase awareness about orphans' needs and their rights, the importance of the caregiver's role, and reduce the social stigma. The orphan care system we built was complete with Watanea's collaboration with regulators and legislative authorities, like the Ministry of Social Solidarity, so that each orphan grows up in a healthy and safe environment and becomes a successful person who believes in their abilities. Someone who can dream and achieve their dreams. Amazing. Yeah, um, Aching, I don't know if you want to discuss just anything that was discussed in your room just for um, the, the final um, couple of minutes here before we switch uh, to Niyoshi's session. Yeah, um, what came across as uh, the means that people use to reach the most vulnerable, um, one was the funds. Some areas were able to use funds reach children who would, would otherwise, who did not have internet access. Um, in some cases, uh, there are people who were able to, with the help of the community, were able to go into the, like community leadership, organized um, meetings, access of um, uh, social workers to get to these vulnerable children. Um, in another context, um, organizations were able to organize door-to-door, -door, um, like mobile outreach um, activities, which went door-to-door -door, um, to reach these uh, um, vulnerable children. They had to reach children. Um, radio and television were used um, from community focal people. Uh, I think this already, these people already existed. Um, there was, there was also. Hi, oh, Aching. Yeah, Hi, Katrina. Hello. Okay. Welcome back. Thank you. Please proceed, Noha. Yeah, sure. Because we're um, we're almost out of time, so. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Katrina, you're you're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Yeah, there seems there were some issues. Um, Aching was just kind of discussing what um, had been discussed in her breakout room, um, but we thought um, if you're on the guild, we could possibly um, share the questions that people had asked you, and they could be answered there if that's possible. Yes, yes that would be that would be great. Sure. Okay, amazing. Um, anything else you wanted to say before we wrapped up then? Thank you very much, I think. Thank you very much for the great discussion, everyone. And thank you for joining the session. Thank you, Ed Shing, and thank you, Katrina.